red crusties pluses. So we have to be wired for sound, and I just forgot. Okay. We'll have a couple of seconds technical delay um, while I put a battery in here. Okay, well, I was hoping not to destroy my credibility at this early stage, but um, <laughs> with a bit of a struggle, we now have the on switch on. Uh, okay, um, Okay. let's take it from the top. So um, for the first three quarters of the class, we'll be looking at consciousness and the mind-body problem. And uh, in particular, we'll spend a lot of time on functionalism, um, which is the most important single idea um, in philosophy of mind and in the sciences of the mind in the last 50 years. It's really, um, how should I put this, science's philosophy of mind. So we will spend a lot of time looking at the functionalist approach to the mind and what it can do and what it can't do, what its limitations seem to be. And we'll then go on to questions about the self, personal identity. All this is on the um, course website, which you can now get to through BSpace. Has anybody tried to get to the course website through BSpace? Did you manage? Uh, we just went there now, actually, and we didn't find any like, papers or anything on there. There aren't uh, papers, no, but um, a website? No. Um, a syllabus? Sorry? Uh, I don't see any web content or resource. Uh, I would yeah. Uh huh. Okay. So so okay. Well, if you, I I I will try and sort it. I thought it. Oh, it is on VSpace now. Uh huh. Well, look at that. Look at all these problems coming up and being resolved so rapidly. <laughs> okay. So the news is you can get to the course website through VSpace. You can get to it um, through my faculty webpage. Um, uh, and uh, you might particularly want to look at the link on the course website where it says lectures, because that tells you what reading there is for each uh, day of the semester. Okay, um, 
Uh, we we'll, won't go the full distance today um, because um, uh, the most important thing you have to do today really is initiate the bonding process with your GSI and um, find a time for a section that will work for you. The GSIs are Jackson Kernian and Austin Andrews. Uh, do you want to identify yourselves? Um, <laughs> you can see what good likenesses the photos are. Um, hi. Say hi, guys. I'm Jackson. Uh, this is some of the secondary grad students uh, studying philosophy of mind stuff. So this is perfect for me. Uh, I'll be looking forward to meeting you guys in the section. Yep, and I'm also. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there are two set books for the class. Um, David Chalmers collection of philosophy of mind, classical and contemporary readings, and John Perry's book, Personal Identity. These are full of wonderful papers, and we'll actually only sample them. Um, okay, and uh, today and on Tuesday, We'll be looking at Descartes' meditations, um, the, the extracts from the sixth and second and sixth meditations in the Chalmers collection. So that's a 10-page reading, and we'll start in on it today. And it would be good if you could read um, that 10-page extract for Tuesday. Um, most of the readings we do in this class are pretty brief. They're six pages, 10 pages long. Um, this is not uh, to make it easy. It's because the readings themselves are pretty dense. Um, or actually, it's not so much that they're dense. They're often introducing unfamiliar and difficult ideas. And it will often happen to you that when you read a paper for the first time, you simply can't make head or tail of what is going on in the thing. Um, this is perfectly normal. Um, at this point, you will experience a strong desire to sleep, um, or at any rate, to do something else. Um, and y y your mission is to resist that. You have to have faith in both the reading and yourself. This is really good stuff. It really does make sense. And you really can do it. But it does mean you, have to spe you may have find yourself spending a couple of hours on a single paragraph. And that's fine. That's OK. That doesn't mean you're being dumb. Or it doesn't mean that the author's being needlessly difficult. It's just that these are unfamiliar ideas, and it takes a while to grasp them. Yeah. So I, I sympathize if you find the experience at first highly disagreeable. But um, if you persist and crack through, there is really some wonderful stuff that we're going to do. We're going to be doing the greatest hits of the last 300 years in thinking about the mind. OK, so we'll start out with the uh, uh, Descartes. And um, um, then the next up, which we'll do next uh, Thursday, are the extracts from Ryle in the Chalmers collection. So again, that's just seven pages. But give yourself plenty of time to address those seven pages. Are there any questions just about the basic setup of the class right now? I think most of your questions should be answered on the, on the website. Yeah. Uh, you don't need to bring the textbooks to class. You may want to. It may be helpful to, to, to work through it. But I'm, I'm not, uh, anything I quote will be on the screen. So you don't need to have a text there, if you see what I mean. But you may want to. It's your, it's your choice. Yeah. OK, so there are three uh, things I want to do today. One is just to get stated the mind-body problem, how the mind-body problem comes up in the first place. I mean, it's a familiar phrase. but how did it first arise? How did people start out thinking about the mind-body problem? And then one resolution of the mind-body problem is dualism. Dualism says there's two different kinds of stuff. There's material stuff, and there's the stuff your mind is made of. And they're just different. And that solves the mind-body problem, because it's just two different things. And there isn't really a big issue about how they're connected. Um, and then uh, finally today, I'll look at problems with dualism. We'll go back over this stuff to you on um, Tuesday. OK, so what sets up the mind-body problem is back in the 17th century, when mathematical physics first came on the scene, it is really physics that generates the mind-body problem. Um, <coughs> physics really destabilizes 
our picture of the ordinary world and what we're doing in the universe, what's going on in the universe, it really destabilizes it in ways that are still puzzling today that we still haven't really come to terms with. Um, here's a, a remark by Coire, the historian Coire, about um, uh, how the implications of the new physics started to be seen back in the 17th century. Not only are the heavenly spaces empty and void, but even the so-called solid bodies are full of void. The particles that compose them are by no means closely packed together, but are separated from one another by void space. The Newtonians from Bentley on took an enormous pride and pleasure in pointing out that matter proper occupies a practically infinitesimal part of space. You get the impression that this was a particularly annoying thing that Newtonians used to do. But really, when you think about it, think about what physics is telling you about what is in this space-time zone, this classroom right now. And what is here, according to physics? Are we talking about people, colors, projector screens? No. All we have are the fundamental particles floating in the void. There are just mostly empty space in this room. Occasional clumps of gluons, um, the operation of basic physical forces, and that's the whole thing. That is all that's going on. Now, that really destabilizes our picture of the world. Think about how uh, the world would have looked to, say, a 16th century peasant, um, innocent of mathematical physics, someone who'd never heard of mathematical physics. You look at, let us say, a flower. And the flower itself, with its coloration, with all its delicate, tremulous beauty, is just out there a fact about the world that you simply encounter. The world is full of these medium-sized physical objects with all their delicate colorations, with um, all their wonder and variety, and you just happen to be plunged in amongst them, and you start finding out about them. So before physics, when you're innocent of physics, you can think that what's going on when you see a flower is that there's that thing out there, there's you, and you see it. What could be plainer than that? Your conscious experience of the flower is just a relation between you and a bit of the world that's there anyway. That flower would have been as it is whether or not humans had ever existed, whether or not there were ever minds at all. But after physics, what physics is telling you is out there in the world, there is nothing like that delicately beautiful flower. There are only the fundamental particles. What is going on is that those fundamental particles are generating in you sensations of color and taste and smell and so on. But physics doesn't talk about color or smell or taste. And physics gives you comprehensive coverage of the universe. Physics tells you um, there's just one world, and it's a physical world, and there is no more to it than that. If there's no more to it than that, then the flower, as it seems, is not something that's out there independent of you. What's out there is just a configuration of gluons, and they generate um, uh, these sensations in you of color and smell and taste. So physics takes away the regular world. It also um, condemns us to a kind of loneliness, a real existential loneliness. Because what's going on when I look at the scene right now is these layers of atoms are generating sensations in me when you look around the room right now, these layers of atoms are generating sensations in you. But 
for all we know, they're generating different sensations in you and in me. Our minds might be completely different. You don't know whether your color sensations are just the same as mine. In fact, when you think about it, um, it's not just that you don't know whether your color sensations are the same as mine. I mean, consider this. Don't look now, but think about the person sitting right next to you. I mean, it's entirely possible that although they are physically just like a regular human, they have no sensations at all. Maybe they are a kind of zombie. They're physically just like a human, but with no consciousness. Why not? Maybe that would explain some puzzling things. But you don't know. I mean, maybe the person next to you is having sensations. Maybe they are just the same as yours. But if that's true, it's just an accident. You have no way of telling. So this picture of physics, a configuration of atoms out there generating sensations in us, um, seems to drive us into a complete loneliness. You don't know what sensations other people are having. You don't even know whether they're having any other sensations. So. This is just an artist's impression of the fundamental particles and the fundamental physical forces. Um, but that's all that's really there. And the thing about the world, the way physics describes it, where it's all, um, are there any physics majors in the class? What is there? Gluons? Gluons, right? Quarks, yeah. There's um, gamma ray bursts. There's um, spectroscopic emissions. There's um, black holes. The thing about the world as described by physics is that there is absolutely nothing in the world that it would be possible to care about. All the world of people, of ordinary concerns, of beautiful things, is just not there in the description of the world given by physics. So when you think of the problem that physics is really a complete description of the world, then the implication of this is, well, it would be natural to feel a kind of terror at this point. I mean, a kind of scream seems to be a reasonable reaction. To f <laughs> Maybe that's just a liberal arts reaction <laughs> to physics. Um, if that's all that's really there, then the world is really very alien to the world of our ordinary concerns. All that's going on when you look at the flower is that there's a collection of atoms out there. There's an atomic structure out there. And your sensations are projecting the colors and smells and tastes onto that atomic structure. As you look around the room, there is nothing in the room but collections of atoms. But you are projecting um, different things. Your mind is projecting different things onto that scaffolding of atoms. Like, a, like being in a movie theater, your mind is projecting this stuff onto the world out there. Well, that's already a little bit distressing. But at this point, the really hard question is, where does the mind itself fit in? The mind itself doesn't seem to be capable of being described mathematically. The mind itself doesn't seem to be capable of being brought under um, basic physical laws. So you can say that the color of the flower is a projection by the mind onto the atomic reality. That makes sense. But you can hardly say that the mind itself is a projection of the mind, if you see what I mean. That, that doesn't make any sense at all. The mind itself is not a projection of anything. So how can that be? Either physics is incomplete, or else we have a really hard problem of trying to understand where the mind fits in to the physical world. So something like that, I think, is the background to where the mind-body problem comes from. 
it comes from physics because it's only once you have physics that you have a sharp conception of what matter is. And then once you know what matter is, you can ask about the mind. And is that matter? How does that work? How is it connected? OK. That's the origin of the mind-body problem. Comments? Protests? Uh, any, anyone wants to sort this out? Is, come on. <laughs> Surely someone has it. Yes? I mean, we've talked a lot about senses like, or sensations. Um, yes, right. Thinking, yeah. I wasn't really distinguishing between thinking and sensation. Um, but you're right, there, there, there does seem to be a difference there. Um, thinking, I guess, is something like what you do in language, right? What you, what you and I are doing right now, thinking out loud, yeah? Sensation seems, how should I say, you don't need a language to do that. When you look at the flower and you get that sensation of color, that's not itself thought, yeah? But there's some connect between them that, um, the, uh, uh, the sensation makes the thought possible. You wouldn't be able to think about colors unless you had sensations of colors. Yeah? And maybe it's only thinking about color that actually does the projection of the color onto the world that allows you to judge that there are colors in the world. So I guess um, I'm thinking of the mind as a kind of package with both sensation and thinking. And something like that is constituting the projection apparatus of the mind. You, you see what I mean? Yeah. Um, and then the question is, that package of sensation and thinking, how does that fit into the world, the physical world? Yeah. OK. Like I, I think that would be true too, but the, the, that's a kind of intramural question about the relation between thinking and sensation. At the moment, I'm asking a much broader thing, which is take thinking and sensation, however they're related, how do they connect to physics? Yeah, uh, yeah. Didn't you argue that sensations are just part of physics? Because sensations relate to physical things, colors, smells, tastes, and blood, those are physical things. Physics, you wouldn't have the sensation. Yeah. But, uh, th think about what you'd see in a physics textbook. I mean, in, in, in the 17th century, the big move was to do two things, to say matter is ultimately made out of atoms, little round hard billiard balls. Yeah, th 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 that was the picture. And the atoms are governed by um, mathematical laws. You can measure everything. Th 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 that's the whole idea. Everything is measurable. That's a very counterintuitive idea. If you are just as an, suppose you're an intelligent child of six or um, an intelligent medieval, and you want to find out how, how the world works, how a tree works, for example. Um, well, if you want to find out how a tree works, how do trees grow, how do they um, originate, you want to understand what goes on with a tree. Well, you could measure the tree. That seems, it just seems obvious that's not going to tell you anything very much, right? So until the 17th century, people thought numbers don't have much to do with it. Um, if you want to understand how a tree works, what you have to do is read Aristotle and think about it really hard, yeah? And that was the wrong answer, but it, it's a very natural answer. I mean, you know, what, what, measuring it? What's that going to do with it? Um, and the really bold move in the 17th century was to say, no, measurement can tell you the answers to everything. The measurable quantities solve the whole thing, tell you everything. So the, um, the mathematical characteristics of fundamental particles, you can get all the rest from that. But the trouble is um, that the sensations aren't themselves atomic. They don't seem to be constructions from the atomic. Yeah? So they don't fit in to the mathematical physics picture. Oh, yeah, yeah. Could it be more of a partnership? Because I mean, there are people in the world who have lots of sensations. They're deaf or they're blind. But their mind, I'm sure, goes beyond that and starts creating maybe its own thought of what those things are. Or maybe reverse, people who are very lacking in their mind, maybe they're, um, they're disabled in some way or whatever, but I still think their sensations bring them some type of knowledge to what color, color or sense or taste is. 
That must be right. I mean, your brain must have something to do with it. If you bash someone's brain, you're going to make a difference to what sensations they're having. So no argument about that. But the question isn't really, um, can the physical stuff affect the mind? The question about the mind is, what is it anyway? We know we're thinking that maybe the whole world is describable by physics. But then what's the mind? And it's not really, does the physical stuff affect the mind? It's, what's this thing? What are we talking about? Not does this affect that, but do we even know what this is? How are we going to say what this is? It's almost like the question, um, is this a, is a cosmic failure? We're going to come on to that very question in just a second, that question about existence. OK, I, let's take this one too uh, quickly, and then we should move on. But yeah. yeah. I was going to ask, you said mathematics does not describe the mind, right? Uh, yes. When you were restating the, um, the point of Descartes, or was that a knowledge? Well, um, what, I said, what I meant there was um, it's really the two things, that matter is made of atoms, and that all the characteristics of the atoms are mathematically describable. Now, um, the the um, uh, if you take s sensations of color or taste, yeah, the question is, can you measure those? Is there a way of putting a ruler against your taste sensations and measuring them? And that's the thing. It, it doesn't seem to be. Yeah, Th That was how it seemed back then. I mean, uh, I think Galileo was the first person to make this point. But back in the 17th century, most I mean, Galileo is really the father of mathematical physics. And um, uh, th that was how it seemed to him. And I think back in the 17th century, they're thinking, that's right. How, how are you going to measure? It should, <laughs> you know, yeah. Uh, last one. And the, 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 uh, you, I saw you first. Oh, okay, let's take, let's take these two quickly. But yeah, yeah, right. I'll try to be quick. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why that phenomenon actually isn't just a Well, can't it be a concept? I'm sorry, what's not made of matter? Uh, color. That's the color. 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 Oh, color, yes, right, right, right. It doesn't have to be a matter. It's just a concept that can describe something. Okay, but how can it be a concept that describes? If it describes, does it describe something physical or not? But the software in the computer is not small particles. I mean, it's just something that we see as particles. The software exists? I mean, the software part of the physical world? I mean, the software, the application of quantum laptops, uh -huh. they are not made of uh, particles. They are not numbers. That's really weird. Um, <laughs> so, so part, uh, software is non physical? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you're talking about the concept. Of Well, the, 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 there's, there's something there that's not quite right, but there's something there that is importantly right. The software is a good model, and we'll actually spend quite a bit of time on the idea that the mind is the software of the brain. Um, that is actually quite a, a, a powerful idea, that just as a computer runs programs, your brain is a bit of hardware running software, which is the mind. That's what it is to have a mind is to be a, comp uh, a, a computer running the appropriate software. Yeah? That your brain's, so that's an important idea. Um, but um, I, I just want to get that this big blockbusting thing I'm asking, is this physical or not? Um, if you want to really bring that to bear on a big question, then you have to be very clear about whether you're saying software is physical or not. Yeah, um, yeah last one. Very good. Oh, 
Okay, there are two different things here. One is to say sensation is based on neurochemistry. The other is to say that sensation is just the same thing as in neurochemistry. Yeah? And uh, again, that's an important idea that we're going to spend a lot of time on, actually, or, or, or the, the whole line of thought you just set out. Um, but in a moment, I'm going to give Descartes' argument that it's one thing to say the sensation is caused by the neurochemistry, but it's not right, Descartes is going to argue, to say that the sensation is just the same thing as the neurochemistry. That's really the critical thing. Yeah. Uh, now the really last one. Okay. I mean, these are all excellent questions. These are all bringing up things that were uh, big themes. Yeah. Yeah. But if you destroy the medium, the information is gone. Right. It's the same for the activity of the mind, but there's a different state of uh, components that are in a specific order, and the mind, yeah. and the mind just disappears when the order is destroyed. Yeah. You guys are basically um, um, inventing functionalism here. <laughs> and, and the uh, computer model of the mind, which is going to take us. Um, another couple of weeks to labor up to. So bear with me as we labor up to these questions. <laughs> yeah. um, but let me put it right back to you. If, um, if what you're saying is correct, if there's no more to sensation than the brain running a particular kind of software, then it should be child's play to make a computer that has sensations. Making computers that have sensations? I have one right here. Um, uh, is it, does it have sensations? You, you could do that. Yeah, I mean, look, suppose you have a, a set of laptops orchestrated all over the world, right? You could run soft. I mean, you wouldn't even, I mean, if you've got a powerful enough laptop, um, you're not going to need uh, a network. Just amp up the uh, processing power of this laptop. A couple of years will be there. Um, and then that's going to have sensations. That, that, that's what you're saying. Well, okay, we're going to spend a lot of time on this idea. I, I just want to be clear about what you have to be saying, uh, if you really mean that. Yeah. Okay. But he, here's Descartes' argument that um, uh, none of this can be right. Yeah, none of these important ideas can be right. Um, Descartes says there are two different kinds of stuff. There's mental stuff and there's physical stuff. Um, and one argument, there are three arguments he gives for this in the meditations. I'm just going to look at one of them. The argument he gives is the certainty with which you know of your own existence is greater than the certainty with which you could know of the existence of any physical thing. Therefore, the mind and the body can't be identical. So, well, here's what he's thinking. How do you have knowledge of the world around you anyhow? How do you have knowledge of um, uh, the physical world? Well, you get your knowledge of the physical world from your sensations. And what's going on, according to physics, is that the sensations you have are just caused by the atoms out there. So if that's what's happening, you, the sensations that you're having are being caused by the atoms out there. Well, if that's, what's, well, if that's your hypothesis about what's causing those sensations, well, actually, those very same sensations could have been caused in endlessly many different ways. As you sit here, um, um, uh, full of intellectual stimulation, your inquiry mind questing into the depths of the mind-body problem, um, uh, you take it for granted that what's going on is that the physical stuff is configured um, in just, uh, you're in a room full of other people, um, and so on. But of course, it's also possible that you could, maybe you didn't make it to the lecture after all. Maybe you're still at home. 
Maybe you fell asleep by the fire and you're simply dreaming that you're in a lecture room. Maybe you're actually in an astrophysics lecture dreaming that you're in a philosophy lecture. That could be. That could happen. Um, you, you could be having the very same sensations with a quite different cause. Descartes puts this point in a lot of different ways. He says, well, maybe there could be a malicious demon causing those sensations. Maybe um, your roommate is an evil neuroscientist who whipped your brain out just as you were about to set off for lecture and is stimulating you to think that you made it. The physical world could be radically different to the way you think it is. Um, the idea that uh, you're living in um, a university town with uh, lots of other people around, that you're in a room with tables and chairs, that's just one hypothesis among many to explain the sensations you're having. And this is not just an idle speculation. There really are people that are the insane, that are the dreamers, um, who think oh, you're having the sensations of a unicorn at midnight. Um, there may be no unicorn. It may not be midnight. Um, but you could be having those sensations anyway. Um, or as Descartes more prosaically gives the example, you could be looking at a square tower um, from a distance, and it could seem round. So even in the worst case, though, Suppose that you're um, an insane madman who's fallen asleep and is dreaming about um, a, a square tower that, uh, that actually just loops round. Right? Suppose there's nothing there but a collection of mistaken sensations in your part. Do you still know of your own existence? You could be completely wrong about every aspect of the physical world. None of it might be as you think it is. Um, but do you know about your own existence? Even in that worst case, Descartes says, you still know of your own existence. He famously says, this proposition, I am, I exist, that's necessarily true whenever it's put forward by you or conceived by your mind. So the physical world might not be there, but you still know of your own existence. So you can't be a physical thing, because your knowledge of your own existence is greater, is more certain than your knowledge of um, the existence of any physical thing. That proposition, I am, I exist, this is Descartes, that's necessarily true whenever it's put forward by me or conceived by my mind. So just to go over that argument, the sensations you have are merely being caused by atoms in the world around you. So those very same sensations could be caused in endlessly many different ways. That means that um, uh, your current conjectures about how the physical world is, they're just one hypothesis among many about the causes of your sensations. So your knowledge of the physical world is always uncertain. There's always something provisional about it. It's maybe just your best guess as to what's actually going on. But your knowledge of your own existence is not like that. So what is the self? If the self is something non-physical, then what is it? And Descartes says, well, what shall I now say that I am? when I am supposing that there is some supremely powerful and, if it is permissible to say, malicious deceiver. You see the caution there that um, if there really is some evil genius who is manipulating all your sensations um, to make you think you're sitting in a lecture room, then um, you really ought to be respectful. Um, and so <laughs> if you're going to say malicious, um, you better do so cautiously. Um, but uh, uh, so I'm now supposing my sensations are just manipulations by some demon deceiving me. Um, 
But what can I say that I am? Can I assert that I have even the most insignificant of attributes that I said belong to the nature of a body? Can you say that you have a particular weight, that you have a particular height, that you have blood? You can't say any of that stuff because all that might be just generated by the demon giving you sensations of being a particular height or weight or having blood or whatever. So what is it that you always encounter when you think about what must be there, what definitely exists, no matter what is going on in the physical world? Yourself, yeah, but can you say a bit more about what characteristics of yourself? Boy, very good, right, you have your thoughts. At last I have discovered it. You guys could do this in your own, actually. Um, so, okay, so we just r r had functionalism and the mind is software and, uh, okay, who said thought? Who said thought? Descartes. Okay, very good, <laughs> right. That's what Descartes says. Um, all this could be a dream. Your thoughts are still there. Your thoughts are definitely there. You have certain knowledge of your own thoughts in a way you don't have certain knowledge of anything else. And that thinking you will always find when you find your own existence. So the self as a thinking thing must be something non-physical. That's the argument. OK? Plain enough? Yes? Uh, oh, good. Questions from the back. Uh, one, two. Wonderful. Somebody could be manipulating your thoughts. Yeah. And, I, and it's kind of like that wouldn't matter. It doesn't matter to them. Right? I mean, what if one person is manipulating another person? Like, what if everything that's going on in my head just took over everything? Like, somebody else is like saying the exact same thing all of them, and then you think that we're all kind of the same thing, and maybe we're not. Right. That's really an interesting idea. Um, but notice that there's, um, there's a way in which it's quite commonplace to try to manipulate people's thoughts. I mean, that's what you do in a conversation, right? I try and make you have thoughts. You try and make me have thoughts. Yeah? Manipulation suggests something a bit stronger, that you've actually taken charge of what thoughts someone is having. Yeah? But notice that even if someone has taken charge of what thoughts you're having, even if Bill Gates really has got in there and is making me have all those thoughts. When I think I am, I exist, I am still being confronted with thoughts. I may not be in charge of them, but there's still thoughts there. If I weren't having the thoughts, I wouldn't even, there, there wouldn't be anything to be manipulated, if you see what I mean. And I wouldn't be able to say I am, I exist, because to say I am, I exist, is already to be thinking. Whenever I think, um, even if I'm just a pawn in the hands of this evil wizard, then still I have thoughts. So it's not much of a claim, if you see what I mean. It's, it's not yet to say, I am a free agent or something like that. But it's just to say I exist, and that thinking, knowledge of my thinking, is bound up with my knowledge of my own existence. Yep. That is Descartes' cogito. I think, therefore I exist. Uh, yeah. Oh, oh wait, sorry, there, there was another question from the back. Yeah. Uh, sorry, has it gone away? There's something? No, it's gone away. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, the I that you're referring to when you said uh, same thing, just, uh, would it be consistent with your thoughts that you're not Yes. Like, is it a different person? Like, would you say it's different? I feel like people change, you know? So That's like, very good, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it's just like instantaneous, that, like, existence. So, uh, just continue. Okay, we're talking here just about what, the, what Descartes is really getting is um, um, when he says um, that proposition, I am, I exist, is necessarily true whenever it is put forward by me. 
yeah? Um, so what he's getting is the existence of the self at a moment. That's the certain thing. And you're, you're certain of that in a way that you couldn't be certain of the existence of any uh, physical object, yeah? Um, but when you say, I remember um, um, happy days in ancient Egypt, or as one does, right? Um, or when you say, um, I remember that weekend back in 1970, um, then it's possible those memories are implants. Yeah, it's possible your memories of what happened yesterday are implants. You could have been got at. Maybe though the truth will just be revealed to you later. You, uh, uh, you, your current memories are implants. Yeah. Um, so when you say I'm the same as that person back then, um, that's not certain. Yeah. It's just the, the existence of the self at a time. Um, well, okay. One, two, three. Yeah. Um, Yeah, if you, yeah, I mean, it's not even, it's not all the schizophrenia. If I say, well, Campbell thinks, um, you know, I just get a bit taken away with, my, taken away with myself. Um, <laughs> I say, well, you know, instead of saying my view is, well, you know, this is the Campbell, yeah, um, <laughs> as one does, <laughs> right? Then um, that's not going to have certainty, yeah, because um, it could happen, just as you say, that you're, you're carried away and you're saying Napoleon thinks. Yeah, because you think you are Napoleon and so on. Yeah? Like yeah, these delusions. So there is no certainty there. Even if, um, I mean, who knows, maybe I'm actually a millionaire playboy and I just think I'm a humble philosophy pedagogue. <laughs> um, yeah? Then when I say Campbell, I'm actually, uh, th that's just a mistake. That's not me. No such person exists. Yeah? Um, um, so that's not certain. It's really something special about the use of I to refer to yourself. That, that, has a kind of, that gives a kind of certainty that your use of a name doesn't. And that's what your example brings out, I think. Yeah. Is that? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, you, maybe there's no physical stuff. Yeah. Oh, boy. Um, OK. <laughs> right. Um, that, is, I agree, that's the next move. Um, uh, if we're getting it that the existence of the mind is a completely certain thing, then why not say, look, the physics, the atoms, and so on, um, they are just projections of the mind, too. Yeah, I agree, that's a very good move. Um, that, but where we got to is we started out by thinking about um, the flower that you encounter, yeah, and taking everything for granted. And then physics blows that up. And what you're talking about is really the revenge of the mind, if you see what I mean. <laughs> when you say, okay, now we blow physics up, and we say, that's just a projection of the mind. That, again, is an important move. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't wish to say any more than that about this, at this point, except to say that is a big, important idea that uh, needs a lot of discussion. Yeah. Uh, yeah, last one. Yeah. Yes. We can both relate to this. Um, I think that uh, that's a very natural idea, and the, and and it is it is still an important idea that idea that social life and communication is a big piece to have in place here because somehow. Isn't that just as basic as having a mind in the first place, being embedded in a community? Yeah, that, that's an important idea. But remember that um, part of the way that physics destabilizes, just going back quite a bit here, part of the way that physics destabilizes um, our picture of what's going on is that it seems to raise the possibility that your sensations might be entirely different to my sensations. So when I talk about redness, I'm talking about one kind of sensation. When you use the word red, you're talking about a quite different kind of sensation. It might be the sensation I call green. It might be the sensation I have when I hear middle C on an organ. It might be something completely alien. You know, the, 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 our sensations might be completely different. So ordinary, the, 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 the impact of physics here 
is to really destabilize ordinary communication too. Yeah? Because you're just a collection of atoms, I'm just a collection of atoms. There can be these causal interactions, and you're interpreting it in terms of the other person having the same kind of sensations you are. But that might just be a mistake. Yeah? That's what I mean about the loneliness of um, the, the picture generated by physics. Oh, that poignant note. Let me make some last remarks about um, uh, uh, problems with dualism. I hope it's fairly clear that dualism is, um, it has something going for it. It's not just a daft idea. In fact, it's still popular today, uh, dualism. Um, but although um, this argument that, um, uh, so this argument, your knowledge of the existence of the mind is more uh, certain than your knowledge of the existence of anything physical. Um, actually, maybe we should shut the door. Just, uh, it's, it's, we're just on free, so there's going to be a lot of racket from things. Um, so I, I'll just talk for another 10 minutes or so, and then we should uh, get sections going. Yeah? <laughs> the difficulty yeah. kind of interrelated with all the thinking about the quantum. Because in fact, there's this one view, you feel like the whole world around you is not what you're thinking. Yes. Don't you start doubting yourself by making these things? Doubting yourself? Doubting your own existence? Yeah. That's kind of hard. Who is it that's doing the doubting, do you think? I know we're students. We do that every day. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> Do I even exist? <laughs> I think, <laughs> but is it, isn't it right that where it's natural to say that is in a social context, um, what are you saying? Don't you, what you mean is, don't you even realize that I exist? <laughs> you pigs. <laughs> I'm sorry, maybe, maybe this is just autobiographical. <laughs> um, but you see what I mean? That, 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 but really to doubt your own existence it's hard to see how that even makes rational sense because somebody's got to be doing the doubting. So who is it that's doing the doubting if not you? You, you see what I mean? Um, that, 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 that was really the point about Descartes saying, I think, therefore I exist, that doubting that you think, doubting that you exist, doesn't seem to make any sense, except in that social kind of way. Yeah. This is important, and we'll, we, we will come back to ways you might challenge this, but I just want to get over the, the, what Descartes is thinking, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Actually, there's another way to answer that question. Mm -hmm. uh, as, as we uh, just assume that we are uh, misled by a demon, uh, there has to be someone who be cheating. If there's that, someone cheating us, there has to be someone be cheating. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So, so, Exactly. The demon may be cheating me in every possible way, but I have to be there to be cheated for this to be going on. Yeah, that's, that's the point. Yeah, no, that's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, Descartes thinking like this, there are two kinds of stuff in the universe. There's the physical stuff that's made out of atoms and governed by mathematics, and there's the ectoplasm, or whatever you call it, the stuff that the soul is made out of. Um, now, the thing is, once you put it as bluntly as that, there's two different kinds of stuff. There's the ectoplasm and there's the physical stuff. Then a number of things become obvious. First of all, if it turned out that there was ectoplasm, I mean, it's not made out of atoms. It's not governed by regular mathematical physics. Physicists would just be delighted. The physicist who demonstrated that this was so um, would immediately be extremely famous and popular. Um, I mean, because what you'd want to do is say, well, how can we find out about the ectoplasm? How do we find out what? I mean, with um, dark matter, that's exactly what happened. They said this is not the regular physical stuff made out of regular atoms. This is made out of something else. Um, and it's all very exciting to find out what it is. So to say there are two kinds of stuff is actually, it's a perfectly, um, I mean, it really could be true that there are two different kinds of stuff. I don't know how, have you guys ever come across the amber spyglass? No, you're really missing out. Put your hand up if you've read The Amber Spyglass. Put your hand up if it's any good. 
Oh, it's great, right? It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, it's a set of books by Philip Pullman. Um, I mean, they're aimed at 12-year-olds. Um, so <laughs> why I'm glad I'm not alone here. <laughs> but but um, they're absolutely wonderful. But um, Pullman, in, uh, late in the series, this is, kind of, this is a little bit of a spoiler. It's not much of a spoiler. But it turns out that there's a kind of golden dust um, that is what's responsible for consciousness. And the great thing about the amber spyglass is that it lets you see the golden dust. So you, you know, doubtless see huge billowing clouds over, over the room at the moment if you kind of looked out as all this mental, frenetic mental activity is going on. And the thing is, if you think, um, well, there is that ectoplasm, there is the golden dust that generates consciousness, and it's not like regular physical stuff. Well, that really might be true. And then you'd have to find out how there can be such a stuff. But the thing is, um, it's not as if the problems you have at that stage are any easier than the problems you had before. I mean, your knowledge of your own existence is still going to be more certain than your knowledge of the existence of the golden dust or the ectoplasm or whatever it is. Um, and then you're still going to have the question, how can that be generating a mind? The, Physiologist Susan Greenfield said, um, what really got me into physiology, um, this must have been about 40 years ago, I guess, but what got her into physiology was looking at a human brain and thinking that it's all there. As you sit here at the moment, aflame with intellectual curiosity, um, longing for coffee, Mem <laughs> memories of your family, um, thinking of your friends, it's all there. How can that be? That's, that really is the, that's the kind of basic puzzle about the mind. How can your life be being sustained by that? Um, that seems so amazing. How could that be happening? And it doesn't really help to say, well, maybe it's not a brain, maybe it's golden dust, or maybe it's ectoplasm. I mean, that you still have that same basic puzzle. How could that stuff be generating this, my whole conscious life? Yeah, that's, that's the fundamental puzzle. And moving to saying, well, I've got a kind of ghostly brain here, doesn't help a bit. You know, you just shuffled it off. Um, and if you say, as Descartes says, something like, thinking is the essence of the soul. Um, the soul, I mean, when you, that sounds pretty deep, right? Yes? Come on. <laughs> you guys shouldn't be doing philosophy if that doesn't seem pretty deep. <laughs> but, um, but the thing is, when you think about what it's actually saying, thinking is the essence of the soul, you're just saying, well, look, the soul is a kind of ectoplasm or golden dust or something. And it just does that. It just does thinking. That's all you need to know. And that's really just a fake. That is a phony explanation. And look, here's an analogy. Suppose that some intelligent Martians, I mean, everybody knows that Martians are extremely smart, right? Um, suppose that some very smart Martians landed on Earth, and they start finding out all about us and our civilization. And they make a lot of progress. They understand us pretty well. But TV really puzzles them. For some reason, they look, they look at it and they think, I just can't see how they're getting those colored images in the screen. That's really weird. It defeats their best physicists. They don't understand how that works. How do TVs work? But then someone says, look, we've all been working on the wrong track. The reason we're finding it so hard to understand how TVs work is they're not physical at all. They are made of a special TV stuff. And it's TV stuff. If you ask how TV stuff is generating all those brightly colored images, well, that's of the essence of TV stuff. That's just what TV stuff does. And people say, that's brilliant. <laughs> and th there's a career to be had there. But the whole thing is obviously fake. Um, and similarly, if you're puzzled about how the brain can generate the mind, it doesn't really help. It's just a fake to say, well, actually, the brain doesn't generate the mind. 
And what we've got here is some special ectoplasmic stuff. And ectoplasmic stuff, well, that's just the kind of stuff that generates minds. <laughs> that hasn't made any progress at all. I mean, what is TV stuff? How does it make those images? What's its relation to physical stuff? That's what you really want to know. So postulating a special TV stuff wouldn't help with any of the problems that you're trying to understand. How can your knowledge of this thing be so certain, for example? Um, so postulating mental stuff doesn't really solve the problems about mind and brain. It's just making them obscure. Because with the brain, we at any rate know what that is. We, I mean, you can look at it. You know what the thing is. You know how to study it. When you talk about a special ectoplasmic stuff that's not physical, all you know for sure is, I have no idea what that is or how you go about studying it. Um, it's true. I mean, Descartes was really right about this. And this is a problem that is still alive and well today. Um, it's very hard to see how the mind can be physical. But the trouble is, it's not really just a problem about how the mind can be made of atoms. It's a problem about seeing how the mind can be made of any kind of stuff at all. So it really doesn't help to postulate non-physical stuff. We should really, um, I mean, if you can bear it, it's kind of a gory photo. I, I promise you that I, I won't show this in any other classes. <laughs> but, but really, we should just stick with the problem. How can that be generating the buzzing, blooming world of everyday sensation? That is the puzzle we should be sticking with. Um, and OK, I'll ask a couple of questions. And then, uh, yeah. Um, I think that because we look at, because we look at the world in a three dimensional way, that why can't we, or one reason we can just rely on it being another dimension that we can't really sense or see. Another mean? dimension. Yeah, right. Yeah, that was like, there's three dimensions that we're Very good. <laughs> right. Um, That's really a wild it's idea. A, that's interesting. That idea that's um, I, I've never heard that before. That's really a wild imaginative oh. idea. Okay, so the, 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 I don't know if people got that. The idea is that there are the physical dimensions, but then there's an extra dimension mm -hmm. that the mental is in. Yeah, is that a way to put it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like multiple dimensions that like we can't see. You know, because we can see three dimensions. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a great idea, and I, I don't want to just close it off. Mm -hmm. The basic starting questions, though, would be the ones I just raised. Yeah. Um, we need to know how could your if this is a dimension, yeah. how could your knowledge of it be so much certain, more, much more certain than your knowledge of any other dimension? How is that working? How come that the other dimensions don't do sensations and this one does? Mm -hmm. You know, the, the the demand to understand what's going on is just starting here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but I, I don't want to close that off. I'm uh, totally with other people, like, I've never heard that. I, I <laughs> often. Have you heard that, Jackson? No? OK. We, we don't know that one. <laughs> but it, it really is interesting. It's, it's, not, it's not just a daft. Or at any rate, <laughs> let me put it like this. It's no dafter than most of the mainstream ideas. <laughs> right. Yes? Is what makes it so mind-boggling the fact that you know, we can, with brain here, we can make sense, that we can touch it, we can touch mm -hmm. it, you know, we can use our senses to understand it, or just the fact that it's finite, so we feel like we are larger than it because we can hold it. <sighs> Yes. Stretch on and on and on and on. And you can get the end of it. Um, I, I, Descartes certainly thinks there are interesting aspects to our ability to think about the infinite. But on the face of it, I mean, are, are our minds really infinite? Um, we can think about infinity, but that's not the same thing as your being infinite yourself, if you see what I mean. I mean, don't you get tired? <laughs> you see what I mean? I'm, I'm constantly aware of my mind running out on me. Um, and I constantly I'm wishing that I had something a bit better and bigger and sharper. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, my own sense is that my own mind is highly finite. I mean, it, uh, I mean, the physical mind, like the physical mind, but infinite. Because, you know, the closest thing in physics is that, you know, the universe is infinite. We can't measure the end of it. So yeah. if, if physics, you know, measures a lot of things as being finite and, and measurable. But if this physical thing is infinite, uh, 
it, it would be good to read Descartes, uh, look at the Descartes passages with, uh, with questions about infinity in mind, yeah, because he, he, he does say interesting things about that. Um, but that's, that's not what, what I mean, the, the argument we were just emphasizing was your knowledge of this thing is provisional and uncertain. Yeah, it might all be a dream and so on, but your knowledge of your own mind is not. So that can't be the same thing as the mind. Yeah. And if you think of, of, of yourself, I mean, it's, it's that, that thing you said at the start about smelling it and tasting it and so on. That, I mean, I know that whenever I look at that, it, it makes me think of, why would that be fried? Um, but, <laughs> but anyway, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> anyway, um, what were we talking about? Uh, um, yeah, um, the, ba <laughs> the basic thing is, if you think of your own conscious life at the moment, the basic puzzle is, imagine the top of your head sliced off and you're given a mirror on a stick so you can look at your brain from the top and it looks kind of like this. And you're being asked to believe this is all the same thing. My conscious life right now, all my sensations and memories and thoughts, that's the same thing as that stuff. How could that be? Yeah. So it's not really something special about infinity. It's, it's a much more, I don't know, basic difficulty of understanding than that. Okay, so for next time, try and look at those 10 pages of the meditations, make as much progress as you can. Um, and uh, right now your task is to bond with your GSI. <laughs> <laughs>